Yesterday, December 7, 1941, a date which will live in infamy, the United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. The United States was at peace with that nation and at the solicitation of Japan was still in conversation with its government and its emperor looking toward the maintenance of peace in the Pacific. Yesterday, the Japanese government also launched an attack against Malaya. Last night, Japanese forces attacked Hong Kong. Last night, Japanese forces attacked Guam. Last night, Japanese forces attacked the Philippine Islands. Last night, the Japanese attacked Waste Island. And this morning, the Japanese attacked Midway Island. Japan has therefore undertaken a surprise offensive extending throughout the Pacific area. The facts of yesterday and today speak for themselves. The people of the United States have already formed their opinions and well understand the implication to the very life and safety of our nation. In 1941, the United States has little choice but to declare war on Japan. The attack on Pearl Harbor removes any doubt that World War II would be resolved without the intervention of U.S. military forces. Now, seemingly a mainstay of the American military, the United States Cavalry, at the outbreak of World War II, consists of six organized reserve cavalry divisions, four National Guard, and three regular divisions. The need for horse cavalry is continually questioned as American forces gear up for war with the Axis powers. However, the 2nd Cavalry Division is deactivated and its members are chosen to form the 9th Armored Division. This Phantom Division, as the 9th came to be known, effectively guards the Luxembourg border from German attacks, even though the German units usually outnumbered the armored units five men to one. The Phantom Division is awarded with a presidential unit citation, in particular for their actions during the Battle of Remagen, in which the Ludendorff Bridge was saved just moments before demolition. Not only do the members of the 9th defend this position from further German attacks, but the bridge itself came in handy for use in crossing the Lahn River into Limburg, where the Phantom Division frees thousands of Allied prisoners. Their citation tells the harrowing story of the defense of the Ludendorff Bridge. Combat Command B, 9th Armored Division, is cited for outstanding performance of duty in action from the 28th of February to March the 9th, 1945, in Germany. On the 28th of February, Combat Command B launched an attack from the vicinity of Sola, and less than 24 hours later, crossed the Erft River at Derkum. Forcing the enemy into disorderly retreat, the unit headed southeast, reaching the heights west of Remagen 
on the 7th of March, where troops of the command could see the Ludendorff Bridge across the Rhine River with large numbers of German troops fleeing across it. At 1,500 hours that day, a prisoner was captured who revealed that the bridge was mined for demolition and was to be destroyed at 1,600 hours. At 1,535 hours, one column of Combat Company B reached the western approach of the bridge. The span was still intact. Although the destruction of the bridge was imminent, American troops unhesitatingly rushed across the structure in the face of intense enemy automatic weapons fire. An explosion rocked the bridge, but did not destroy it. Engineers scrambled down the abutments, cutting wires leading to other demolition charges and disposing of hundreds of pounds of explosives by hurling them into the river. Bulldozer tanks, working under heavy artillery and small arms fire, filled craters at the bridge's approach to permit vehicular passage. Upon reaching the opposite bank, troops of Combat Command B fought gallantly and cleared the surrounding high ground. Although the strength of the span was unknown, tank units rumbled across the bridge after dark and lent their support to the foot troops. Anti-aircraft artillerymen deployed their weapons so skillfully that in the ensuing days, numerous enemy airplanes were destroyed in vain attempts to demolish the bridge. The superb skill, daring, and esprit de corps displayed by each officer and man of Combat Command B, 9th Armored Division, in their dash to the Rhine, the capture of the Ludendorff Bridge, and the successful exploitation of this first bridgehead across Germany's formidable river barrier made an outstanding contribution to the defeat of the enemy. While the cavalry itself is on uncertain ground at the start of World War II, its methods and skills are put to use by many other units of the American military. Armored, mechanized, and even horse cavalry do play a role in the United States' plan of attack. But in the Pacific, a 24-year-old lieutenant would wind up leading what became the final horse-mounted charge led by the United States Cavalry. Edwin Price Ramsey, a graduate of the Oklahoma Military Academy, enters into active service with the 11th Cavalry Reserve in February of 1941. Commissioned as a second lieutenant in June of that year, Ramsey volunteers with the 26th Cavalry Regiment, an elite unit made up of regular army officers and Filipino soldiers stationed in the Philippine Islands. The 26th, also called the Philippine Scouts, while much smaller in size than a regular cavalry unit, is nevertheless judged by Price to be probably as fine, if not the finest, regiment the U.S. Army had. After the attack on Pearl Harbor, Japan invades the Philippines, and in response, the 26th Cavalry Regiment is deployed as part of the North Luzon Force in an effort to defend the Lingayan Gulf area from landings by Japanese soldiers. American and Filipino forces are soon outnumbered by wave after wave of landing Japanese, and as Allied forces retreat into Bataan, the 26th Cavalry provides the cover fire and support as American and Filipino troops withdraw. January 15, 1942, Philippine Scouts Troop E is ordered to move toward the village of Morong as an advanced guard. Lieutenant Ramsey, in charge of Troop G, offered assistance to Troop E. Ramsey and his Filipino soldiers knew the area well, and even though his unit was scheduled for R&R, Ramsey later stated that he did the one thing they never tell you to do in the Army, volunteer. Ramsey then leads three mounted squadrons into the jungle towards Morong. The 27-man teams encounter Japanese infantry at the village and proceed to successfully fight off the enemy soldiers and hold the town of Morong, 
in what would be the last mounted cavalry charge led on horseback. Only three casualties are suffered by the Allies, and Lieutenant Ramsey suffers a mortar wound. While the historic charge keeps Japanese forces at bay temporarily, sadly, the surviving horses are slaughtered when the squadrons run out of food. Discouraged and disheveled, Ramsey and some of his men escape the surrender of Bataan, in which Japanese captors lead POWs on what became known as the Bataan Death March, in which an estimated 21,600 American and Filipino prisoners perish. In a 2001 special session of Congress, honoring the veterans of the Bataan Death March, United States Representative Dana Rohrbacher recounts the experiences of the POWs. They were beaten and they were starved as they marched. Those who fell were bayoneted. Some of those who fell were beheaded by Japanese officers who were practicing with their samurai swords from horseback. The Japanese culture at that time reflected the view that any warrior who surrendered had no honor, thus was not to be treated like a human being. Thus, they were not committing crimes against human beings. The Japanese soldiers at that time felt they were dealing with subhumans and animals. After his escape, Lieutenant Ramsey goes on to form and lead guerrilla forces for the next three years. Ramsey and over 40,000 Americans and Filipinos fight against Japanese soldiers and communist hook guerrillas in an effort to prepare for the return of General Douglas MacArthur to the island. In addition to covert missions against enemies on Luzon Island, including the Kempate, the Japanese secret police, Ramsey sent vital intelligence to General MacArthur himself. Ramsey's observations and judgment on the character of their Japanese enemies later proves instrumental upon MacArthur's return and the United States' victory in the Pacific. In this memo to MacArthur, Ramsey describes the indiscriminate violence perpetrated by the Japanese upon not only their combatants, but civilians as well. Memo to MacArthur from Edwin Price Ramsey, 16 December 1944. More atrocities committed indiscriminately. No distinctions made between innocent civilians and guerrillas. Similar atrocities occur during zonifications currently done either by districts, blocks, or streets at any hour. Others including women brutally beaten, hand grenades thrown at civilians in groups. 10th and 11th December, about 300 executed without investigation. Males lined up at public plazas, ordered to run and shot in the back while running. While Ramsey may have led the final horse cavalry charge of the United States Cavalry Branch, his work as a part of the Philippine scouts and later as a part of the guerrilla resistance only proves that even a short time serving with the cavalry had made Ramsey an incomparable soldier. Ramsey is a hero to the Filipino people, and for his three years of service on the island nation, the Filipino government awards Lieutenant Ramsey their Medal of Honor, the Philippine Distinguished Conduct Star, the Distinguished Service Star, and many other decorations. General MacArthur personally awards Ramsey the Distinguished Service Cross, in addition to promoting Ramsey to Lieutenant Colonel. The United States also rewards Ramsey with the Silver Star, the Purple Heart, and three Presidential Unit Citations. In 1945, Ramsey returns to the United States, welcomed by a letter from his Commander-in-Chief, Harry S. Truman. July 14, 1945. It gives me special pleasure to welcome you back to your native shores and to express, on behalf of the people of the United States, the joy we feel at your deliverance from the hands of the enemy. It is a source of profound satisfaction that our efforts to accomplish your return have been successful. You have fought valiantly in foreign lands and have suffered greatly. As your commander in chief, I take pride in your past achievements and express the thanks of a grateful nation for your services in combat and your steadfastness while a prisoner of war. 
May God grant you happiness and early return to health. Harry S. Truman. While 1944 sees Lieutenant Ramsey leading guerrillas against the Japanese in the Pacific, mechanized cavalry units like the 106th Cavalry Regiment used its advanced armor vehicles and light tanks to provide reconnaissance to armored and infantry divisions in the European theater of World War II. Equipped with armored vehicles and light tanks, the 106th Cavalry Reconnaissance Squadron fights in France, Germany, Austria, and Luxembourg. Utilizing Bantam Jeeps with mounted 30 to 50 caliber machine guns, M8 Greyhound armored cars with a 360 degree turret mounted 37 millimeter gun, units of the 106th are often the first into battle, engaging in scouting and sometimes reconnaissance fire. Mobile artillery is supplied by the E Troop, consisting of three assault gun platoons with 75 mm howitzers mounted without a turret on an M8 chassis. E Troop also carries supplies and ammunition in two half-track vehicles, providing a mobile headquarters on the battlefield. F Troop consists of five light tank companies. Until 1945, each company is outfitted with five 37 mm M5A1 Stuart light tanks. The Stuart tank proves maneuverable and fast, but its armor plating is found to be insufficient against shells fired from German tanks. In February of 1945, the units upgrade to 75 mm M24 Chaffee light tanks. The larger gun levels the field of battle against the Germans. The 106th Cavalry Commander Colonel Venard Wilson, speaking to his unit on Memorial Day 1945 at St. Wolfgang, Austria, had this to say to his men. That, from a tactical standpoint, was one of the most interesting and successful of our accomplishments. An entire German division, the 16th Infantry Division, was in front of us. Our communications and technique were then developed to such a high standard that our infantry following us hardly lost an hour. We used five or six troops to contain those Germans, slipped around to their north, and delivered our infantry on their objective at five in the afternoon after a 50-mile advance. I wish to pay special tribute to B Troop 106 Squadron and their gallant troop commander, Captain Park, in this operation. This troop was 100 miles in the rear of us when the advance was ordered, came up during the night, arrived at the starting point after the other troops had departed, kept moving as rear troop during the day, and were sent into action late in the afternoon after I had committed the five other troops. Captain Park used one of his platoons on side blocking and reconnaissance missions. And when I arrived at Sharma, we had only Captain Park, two platoons, and a platoon of tanks. It was enough to do the job. The 106th actions in France, and especially those of the 121st Cavalry Squadron, Garner Wilson the Legion of Merit, Legion of Honor, and the Croix de Guerre for outstanding leadership during the cavalry's actions. French General Charles de Gaulle himself issued a citation that praised the 106th for their gallantry and bravery in battle as they fought alongside the second French division in the Vosage Mountains. A magnificent regiment whose brilliant achievements during the time in which it fought with and in support of the 2nd French Armored Division from 20 August 1944 to 10 February 1945 command the highest admiration. In the conduct of these operations, the 106th Cavalry Group USA showed a tenacity and vigor worthy of the greatest praise. Never allowing itself to be cut off, even when it was engaged with a determined enemy force superior in numbers to its own, successfully accomplishing all the missions assigned to it, persistently seeking contact when the enemy concealed himself, this regiment has proven itself possessed of the highest military attributes and of a combat proficiency without equal. Though the cavalry is unsure about its place at the beginning of World War II, the strides being made in France and throughout the European theater during the war make it very clear the cavalry's mix of tried and true reconnaissance tactics and battlefield strategies blend very well with the technological advances of armored vehicles and tanks. 
And while mechanized and heavily armed victory on the battlefield signals a new era in cavalry fighting, the over century old tactics developed by the United States Army Cavalry Scouts also still remain integral to the Allies' victory in Europe and in the Pacific. While mechanized and tank branches of the cavalry and armored division prove themselves as distinct advantages on the battlefields of World War II, cavalry scouts, in use by Americans since the Revolutionary War, still serve in their role as the eyes and ears of command. As early as 1775, cavalry scouts provide reconnaissance on enemy movements and fortifications as well as reports on conditions of terrain and even the weather. Scouts serve as navigators on the battlefield, in addition to their myriad other Cavalry scouts are required to possess a staggering number of common and specialized skills, even at the lowest of ranks, and scouting units are some of the tightest knit groups active in the military. In 1942, the cavalry's initial role during World War II was that of border patrol, as it had been during much of World War I. The United States military reasons that fighting in Europe will be better served with tanks and mechanized cavalry since access to roads and fuel and forgiving terrain is not an issue. Still, even after the attack on Pearl Harbor, the U.S. has no clear plan for response to an attack in the Western Hemisphere. Any enemy landing in Germany sympathizing Mexico or Brazil would be better met by a squad of cavalry whose horses can cover difficult obstacles and can traverse the rugged landscapes of the Southwest in the United States, Central America, and even South America with relative ease in comparison to cars or tanks. In the summer of 1942, at a location near Mansfield, Louisiana. The 3rd Army Louisiana Maneuvers are held from August 4th through September 19th. Ideas from the cavalry and cavalry scouts are further developed as the maneuvers test new aerial artillery recon techniques, anti-tank units, and the addition of armored vehicles to scout units. While the maneuvers involve more troops than in previous years, command is held by experienced reserve cavalry commanders well-versed in combat on horseback. The leaders welcome motor vehicles into the fold with relative ease, integrating and soon passing on to armored cars and tanks the generations of cavalry experience in winning a battle with horse and wagon. The year after the maneuvers, the 91st Reconnaissance Squadron is deployed to North Africa to prepare for battle with Germany and Italy, as well as to fortify the Allies' position in preparation for the invasion of Southern Europe. Cavalry units are also dispatched to New Guinea and other areas of the Pacific. There, cavalry reconnaissance experts like the Code Talkers, members of the 302nd Reconnaissance Troop who hailed from the Lakota and Dakota Indian tribes, who used their native language as an unbreakable code to baffle any Japanese or German forces who might have been listening in. The cavalry scouts provide intelligence and support techniques that are still used to this day. During World War II, while actual horse cavalry may have been coming to an end, the tactics and strategies perfected by nearly a century of United States cavalrymen are utilized by many other units outside the cavalry proper. World War II sees the United States military benefiting from the cavalry's examples, honed by decades of victory through intelligence, firepower, and sterling leadership. One such leader and true battlefield innovator will come to define a generation of soldiers, serving as a high watermark to which other generals would be compared. 
the cavalry has him to thank for advances not only in their traditional saber, but for the advocacy and development of tank warfare. George Smith Patton wastes no time preparing for war. When World War II erupts in Europe in 1939, he seeks to build and maintain an armored fighting force. When I want my men to remember something important, to really make it stick, I give it to them double dirty. It may not sound nice to some bunch of little old ladies at an afternoon tea party, but it helps my soldiers to remember. You can't run an army without profanity, and it has to be eloquent profanity. An army without profanity couldn't fight its way out of a piss-soaked paper bag. As for the types of comments I make, Sometimes I just, by God, get carried away with my own eloquence. During the war, General Patton became almost as famous for his brash personality as for his relentless pursuit of the right people, tactics, weapons, and technology that would win the war for the Allies. Patton led army, cavalry, and armored units throughout the war and in a number of different locales, such as Algerian French Morocco, North Africa, Tunisia, Sicily, Lorraine, Ardennes, the Rhineland, and the Central Europe Campaign. Patton poured himself into his duties even before the United States officially entered the war. In December of 1940, now Major General Patton, led maneuvers by the U.S. 1st Armored Corps in a massive operation that sees 1,000 tanks and vehicles mobilizing from Columbus, Georgia to Panama City, Florida, and back again. While on this assignment, Patton even earns his pilot's license in order to better observe the armored troops' movements from the air. Ruthlessly efficient, Patton also leads the 1st Armored in June 1941, during the Tennessee maneuvers, where 48 hours worth of planned objectives are accomplished in an astounding nine hours. Ever a proponent for striking fast and hard on the battlefield, in 1944, Patton responds to one war correspondent's question about whether or not to slow down the Third Army's rapid offensive in order to spare U.S. lives. Whenever you slow anything down, you waste human lives. While Patton's predilection for rapid offensive movements earns him the nickname Old Blood and Guts, he is still widely admired by those under his command. Among his men, he's affectionately called the Old Man, unquestionably the man in charge. Commanding the Western Task Force in Casablanca, Morocco in 1942, Patton's 33,000 men meet resistance from Vichy French soldiers, but soon successfully land and conquer the city on November 11, 1942, two days after their arrival. Casablanca is soon repurposed as a military port under the oversight of Major General Patton. The Sultan of Morocco holds Patton in high esteem, awarding him the order of Wissam Aloit, the citation reading, the lions in their dens tremble at his approach. The Sultan's opinion is proven correct later in the war. In 1944, the rumors about Patton are legion. It is said that no one holds old blood and guts in higher regard than the German high command. The Allies exploit this very well in an intelligence operation known as Operation Fortitude. German spies are fed a host of misinformation, including that Patton had been named commander of the 1st United States Army Group and that the unit was preparing to invade Pas de Calais in northern France. Germany's 15th Army stationed itself at Pas de Calais 
While the Allies' real operation went into effect, the invasion of Normandy on June 6th, 1944. In reality, Patton did not fly into France until a month later, as Patton was on assignment commanding and training the Third Army in England, a unit that had newly arrived. General Eisenhower gives this command to Patton after a series of incidents that call into question Patton's leadership. In August of 1943, two different privates, Charles H. Kuhl and Paul G. Bennett, were slapped and verbally abused by Patton after the men had been found to suffer from battle fatigue. Patton is incensed by the men, mistaking their fatigue for cowardice. He issues orders for his commanders to similarly discipline any soldier making such complaints. While the slapping incidents prompted a private disciplinary action from Eisenhower, who ordered Patton to apologize to the men he had accosted, they only solidified Patton as a general who wanted to win the war at any cost. Still, Eisenhower and other top military brass knew Patton was an invaluable asset to the American Army, and the successful espionage of Operation Fortitude proves that Patton could theoretically win battles on his reputation alone. In a speech to the Third Army on June 5, 1944, the day before the invasion at Normandy, Patton espoused his strong belief in the American soldier as a winner above all, but did acknowledge that even the greatest generals experience fear. Fear would be plentiful, after all, on D-Day. All real Americans love the sting and clash of battle. You are here today for three reasons. First, because you are here to defend your homes and your loved ones. Second, you are here for your own self-respect because you would not want to be anywhere else. Third, you are here because you are real men and all real men like to fight. Americans love a winner. Americans will not tolerate a loser. Americans despise cowards. Americans play to win all of the time. I wouldn't give a hoot in hell for a man who lost and laughed. That's why Americans have never lost, nor will ever lose a war, for the very idea of losing is hateful to an American. While not without his personal flaws, Patton is remembered best as a ruthless general and a colorful and talented orator, capable of drawing out the best in all those he led. His influence on cavalry tactics, armored warfare, and military leadership is still in practice today and shortly after his death in 1945, the United States Army adopts many of Patton's strategies for use in their training exercises. In his earliest days as a cavalryman, Patton's expert swordsmanship leads to the crafting of the Patton Sabre, which comes to be the standard issue sword for the United States Cavalry in the early 20th century, shortly before the First World War. It is fitting, then, that after World War II, the United States would name its newest design tank after the story general. The M46 Patton Medium Tank, mounted with a 90mm M3A1 gun and boasting 4-inch thick armor, would become the Army's standard issue tank, used primarily in Korea and maintained as a powerful defense tool throughout the Cold War. While Patton's innovations in the field of weaponry, armored vehicles, and tanks propel the United States Armed Forces forward as a leading contender on any battlefield, much of his insight can be attributed to the traditions and tactics that he learned in the United States Cavalry. One such tradition survives from the Cavalry's days fighting in the Civil War on horseback on through to World War II when the Cavalry fights with armored vehicles and tanks. 
From the earliest eras of warfare, flags carried into battle served both figurative and practical instruments on the field of battle, both identifying and inspiring the troops of a certain company with a simple, strong image, and also serving as a rallying point to locating your own company on the battlefield. Cavalry guidons are another example of tradition and esprit de corps used in a useful, practical manner in warfare. A swallow-tailed flag measuring 20 inches by 27 inches and marked with numbers designating troops of regiments and squadrons. The word guidon comes from the Italian guidone for marker or guide. Starting in 1861, Army regulations state that infantry regiments carry both flags representing national colors and regimental colors. The nearly six-foot square standards prove unwieldy for carrying on horseback, so cavalry develops regimental standards of two by two feet, in addition to the guidons carried by individual companies. While carrying his personal guidon, one stripe of red and blue with sabers crossing in the center, General George Custer charged into the ill-fated Battle of Little Bighorn under the guidon of the 7th Cavalry Regiment. Even into the 21st century, the 7th Cavalry fly the swallow-tailed guidon and refer to themselves as Custer's own. The colors can be seen in 2003 as the cavalry leads the charge into the war to liberate Iraq. This tradition endures alongside the tactics and the honor of the United States Cavalry. In March of 1918, the 65th Engineers at Camp Meade are redesignated as the Tank Corps, National Army, and under the command of Colonel Ira Clinton Wellborn. They begin their training on the Gettysburg Battlefield in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. The unit continues its development and training throughout the following year across the United States at Camp Polk, Camp Benning, and Camp Meade. After armistice in 1919, former cavalryman John J. Pershing recommends to Congress that the Tank Corps become an adjunct of the infantry. In 1920, as the National Army is disbanded, two heavy and four light tank battalions were absorbed by the infantry. Twenty years later, in 1940, as the United States prepares for the possibility of entering World War II in Europe, the Armored Force is formed on July 10, 1940. Even though the tank and armored branches are formed from cavalry units, the Army Reorganization Act of 1950 dictates that the remaining cavalry units be absorbed by the armored branch. The reorganization takes full effect in 1951 a year after the United States entered war with North Korea. When North Korea suddenly attacks the Republic of Korea on June 25, 1950, the U.S. Army is weak in tanks, and its units initially enter combat in Korea without them. The 7th, 24th, and 25th Infantry Divisions and the 1st Cavalry Division organized as infantry, all on occupational duty in Japan, had assigned to them the 77th, 78th, 79th, and 71st tank battalions, respectively. But only one company, Company A, of each battalion, has been organized, and those companies have only M24 light tanks. Heavier tanks, it is feared, will damage the Japanese-made roads and bridges. Although the rugged terrain in Korea had been considered generally unsuitable for tank deployment, Russian-made T-34s are used with success by the North Koreans during the early days of the war. American tanks are rushed to the scene in support of the United Nations, and they engage in their first combat on July 10, 1950. several weeks, they are outnumbered. 
it is not until late August that the tank balance in Korea was tipped in favor of the United Nations. By then, more than 500 U.S. tanks are in the Pusan perimeter, outnumbering the enemy's tanks by over five to one. For the remainder of the war, tank units of battalion size and smaller are present in most of the combat actions. The U.S. employs light and medium tanks during the fighting in Korea. The first tanks to enter the fray were the M24 Chaffee light tank. Carrying a 75 millimeter primary armament and an additional 50 caliber Browning machine gun, the Chaffee had been in service since the latter days of World War II. Their primary opponent on the battlefield, the North Korean T-34 85s, had the Chaffee not only out-armed and out-armored, but many of the American M24 tanks accrued by troops having been reassigned from post-World War II occupational duties in Japan. As such, the inexperienced crews serve as one more detriment to the success of the M24 Chaffee in Korea. Later in the war, the Chaffee proves more effective in a reconnaissance role, supported by heavier tanks. However, the M24 Chaffee's initial failures on the battlefield has the United States scrambling for a solution. Development had begun on the M41 Walker Bulldog in 1949. In their rush to aid the M24 in Korea, the Bulldog winds up merely using the conflict as a testing ground. While the tank is well-armed and maneuverable, its engine is an overly loud gas guzzler, and the sheer weight of the Bulldog causes problems transporting the tank by air. The two medium tanks that see the most use in Korea both bear the names of legendary cavalrymen. Named for General John Blackjack Pershing, the M26 Pershing medium tank is designed and produced following World War II. Initially designed as a heavy tank, Army regulations and new requirements for heavy tanks in 1946 see the Pershing redesignated as a medium tank. While the firepower and armor are superior to the M4 Sherman it replaces, the M26 Pershing proves lacking in its mobility. In 1950, to aid the Chaffees and Pershing tanks, the M46 Patton medium tanks arrive in South Korea. At 44 metric tons with armor up to four inches thick, the M46 Patton is also armed with a 90 millimeter M3A1, a 50 caliber M2 machine gun, and two 30 caliber M1919A4 machine guns. The Pattons proved to be a worthwhile adversary to the North Korean T-3485s, and 200 M46 Pattons are on the ground in Korea by the end of 1950. Though Pershing tanks initially outnumber the Pattons, by the end of 1951, the Pershings are all withdrawn from combat. Now that tanks and other armored vehicles have all but replaced horses, even in cavalry reconnaissance actions, recon, transport, and sustained suppression fire from the air become a priority for the United States in 1965. In June of that year, the Department of Defense authorizes the creation of the 1st Cavalry Division Air Mobile. Much of the focus in developing air cavalry is on mobility. Many advisors believed that lack of mobility in the Korean War led to the protraction and stalemate of the war, and French forces in 1954 at Dien Bien Phu suffered the same. Increased mobility through helicopters, like the C-47 transport, means stronger logistical and medical support, aerial command posts providing flexible and more informed command, and an advantage over ground maneuverability. The harsh jungle conditions in Vietnam made travel on the ground challenging, but air transport and gunships clear such hurdles with ease. From the very early 1960s, American military advisors have been present in Vietnam to aid the South Vietnamese forces as they were fighting 
against the invading communist North Vietnamese. With the U.S. troop count increasing year by year, former President Dwight Eisenhower pushed for an outright declaration of war in a 1967 speech to Republican congressmen. With 450,000 U.S. troops now in Vietnam, it is time that Congress decide whether or not to declare a state of war exists with North Vietnam. Previous congressional resolutions of support provide only limited authority. Although Congress may decide that the previously approved resolution on Vietnam given President Johnson is sufficient, the issue of a declaration of war should at least be put before the Congress for decision. By the time the governments of the Western world begin to cast their worried gaze upon the situation in Vietnam in the early 1960s, the United States Cavalry has evolved into a completely motorized and mechanized fighting force on land and will soon establish its air cavalry tactics. Tanks and other armored vehicles used in World War I, World War II, and in the conflict in Korea have been improved upon in such a way as to establish armored cavalry and other armored branches of the military as mainstays. Soon, we will see not only cavalry and army forces making use of armored attack vehicles on the ground, but also in the air. As the United States enters battle in Vietnam and later conflicts in the Middle East, the legend of the cavalry continues to be written as the introduction of the helicopter extends the reach of armored cavalry vehicles. But even as the cavalry embraces the future of technological capabilities, which traditions will remain unshaken? We shall soon see that many aspects in the culture of the United States Cavalry endure to the present day. watching. If you'd like to help us produce more compelling historical content like this, please like, comment below, and share this video with fellow history buffs. And of course, be sure to subscribe to help keep history happening.